Uh, hello, uh, I'm Victor Strandberg, and we're back for another session in our course on the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, I want to define a very important philosophical term that undergirds Eliot's career. Now, I mentioned earlier that I renounce professional jargon. I, too, dislike it. But in this case, uh, the term naturalism as a philosophical formulation is so important that we have to stop and define it for the purposes of this course. Naturalism, briefly defined, <clears throat> is the concept that nature is all that exists. There is no supernature. Uh, this concept, of course, contradicts the thousands of years of our religious heritage in the Western world, notably the Christian heritage that has been the dominant religion in the Western world. Uh, if we say there is no supernature, then certainly our concept of God changes a great deal. The miracles attested to in the Bible and those performed by Jesus could not have happened without the supernatural and the hope of having a better life in the next world is likewise a delusion if there is no supernature. The cause of the rise of the uh, concept of naturalism is the rise of the natural sciences, beginning back in the time of Copernicus and Galileo, uh, Galileo who was held under house arrest for propagating the idea that the earth goes around the sun, whereas we can clearly see that the sun goes around the earth uh, as the church had uh, insisted. Uh, we move up to the time of uh, Isaac Newton, of course, and his uh, brilliant uh, works of genius in physics, and on up to, for our purposes, the most important of these scientists, Charles Darwin, whose theory of evolution undermined the whole concept of man's status as a spiritual being destined for life in the next world. <clears throat> I'm going to cite, by way of defining these terms, the effect of the idea of naturalism on three American writers who preceded T.S. Eliot. <clears throat> uh, writers such as these who threw the problem of naturalism into the laps of 20th century writers, uh, and so many of them did contend mightily with this concept and its implications. Hemingway, Faulkner, uh, T.S. Eliot, very prominent among them. <clears throat> the first writer I'm going to cite, whose upbringing as a believing Christian came to collide with the beliefs associated with naturalism is Herman Melville. He was brought up as a Presbyterian, a believer. And then uh, before he wrote Moby Dick, he had a tremendous reading experience, devoured a number of very important and uh, serious books, not just novels, um, before he wrote his masterpiece. Now, in Moby Dick, he cites the crisis of belief as a basic structure of that novel. That is, Ismail's engaged in a search for beliefs to live by. And the characters represent various modes of belief. Starbuck is a Christian. Uh, Stubb, as the name indicates, is somewhat of a, a fatalist. And uh, Flask is a hedonist, as his name would indicate. Uh, Queequeg is a noble savage. And Ishmael adopts these philosophies in turn, finds each of them lacking. And so we end up with Ishmael, the only survivor of this ide ideological voyage, uh, who is still searching for beliefs to live by, has perhaps ascertained a few practical uh, such ideas as the book ends. A belief in the human bond, a belief in uh, pity as against the cruelties he has observed, uh, and a few other such uh, practical ideas to live by. 
In uh, chapter 114, called The Gilder, Melville describes the crisis of belief as follows. Uh, we move, he says, through infancy's unconscious spell, boyhood's thoughtless faith, adolescence doubt the common doom, then skepticism, then disbelief, resting at last in manhood's pondering repose of if. He goes on to conclude the secret of opportunity lies in the grave, and we must there to learn it. You'll find out if there is an afterlife only after you die. In fact, five years later, Melville visited his friend Hawthorne in Liverpool, England, when Hawthorne was the consul there representing the American government. <clears throat> the two men went out for a walk among the sand hills, and Hawthorne in his notebook for November 20th, 1856, noted the following, that Melville informed me that he had pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated. That is, he accepts this naturalistic view that nature is all that exists, that there will be no afterlife. I accept my annihilation, he told Hawthorne. But still, Hawthorne observed, Melville does not seem to rest in that anticipation, and I think will never rest till he gets hold of a definite belief, which Melville failed to do through the rest of his career. I think his failure to get hold of a definite belief to live by explains largely the collapse of his writing career when he was still in his 30s. He wrote very little, some poetry, but otherwise very little, for the remaining half of his life. <clears throat> we move on a generation later to Mark Twain. <clears throat> like um, Melville, he was brought up as a believer, a Presbyterian. In his 30s, after he got married, he still said grace at meals. But then he started to read these naturalist thinkers. He read Darwin, Origin of Species, and in 1871, when Darwin published The Descent of Man, which applied evolution to our human species, Melville was convinced that the naturalistic view of life is correct, that his traditional religious beliefs were no longer tenable. And so his concept of God is that God is simply the God of nature, not of a supernature. <clears throat> Accordingly, he says about God, in his notebook for May 27, 1898, he says the following, God cares nothing for man's flatteries, compliments, praises, prayers. It is impossible he should value them, impossible that he should listen to them, these mouthings of microbes, uh, the microbes, of course, being our human species. God's real character, he says, is written in plain words in his real Bible, which is nature and her history. The Bible of nature tells us no word about any future life, but only of this present. The book of nature tells us distinctly, God cares not a rap for us, nor for any living creature. <clears throat> we do not know what the object of living is, for the book of nature is not able to tell us. We move finally to Theodor Dreiser, uh, still later and closer to T.S. Eliot's time. Dreiser, who was brought up by a devout Roman Catholic uh, father and who maintained his beliefs in the Catholic faith until he started to read the philosophers who propagated the naturalistic view of life, most of them followers of Darwin. So he says this in his memoir, A Book About Myself, published in 1922. <clears throat> he says, at this time, as a young man, <clears throat> I had the fortune to discover Huxley, Tyndall, and Herbert Spencer, three propagators of naturalistic science. Herbert Spencer, whose book, First Principles, blew me intellectually to bits. Hitherto, until I had read Huxley, I had some lingering filaments of Catholicism about me, faith in the existence of Christ, 
the soundness of his moral deductions. Now, in its place, was a definite conviction that spiritually one got nowhere, that there was no hereafter, that one lived and had his being because one had to, and that it was of no importance. Of one's ideals, struggles, sorrows, and joys, it could only be said that they were chemic compulsions, chemical compulsions, resulting from the hope of pleasure and the fear of pain. So there's your naturalistic view of life at the time it was passed on to T.S. Eliot, a view of life that greatly diminishes human stature and possibility. Uh, so we'll leave it at that point with a final comment, I think, that sums up this naturalistic dilemma, a very short sentence by a writer named Joseph Wood Crutch. Quote, Nature has many means, but no ends. That is, no purpose. And if nature has no purpose, we as creatures in nature have no purpose either, ultimately. And this philosophical dilemma, then, would show up in Eliot's work as well as those of other writers, such as Hemingway and Faulkner, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, we'll end the session here. <clears throat>